Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Spotlight Show on the St. Genevieve Museum Learning Center. I'm Stephanie Goodell, and I'm Director of Operations for the Museum. Joining me this evening is Guy Darrow, our Curator, Richard Becky, our Public Relations Director, Robert Wolk, our Museum Chair, Kendall Hart, our Art Director, and his wife, Joanna, our Marketing Director. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you, uh, thank you for having us. Yeah, no problem. Let's hear from Guy first. So Guy, how long have you been collecting artifacts? Probably ever since I was a little kid, because my parents were uh, hunters, and since very little, they would travel all over the country and go to all the different state parks and that. And while they were doing all that, they, my mom and dad might be out hunting deer, but I would have the uh, camera, my rock camera, and I'd be off doing something else, you know. And mm -hmm. over the years, uh, they took me to museums, and then I uh, eventually uh, got really interested in rocks and fossils and artifacts and and then it just took off from there and that's all I've ever all I've ever been interested in is ancient things or things that are lost or something that fell from the outer space or <laughs> you know things of that nature yeah. what's your favorite artifact that you've collected so far oh boy boy there is a lot of them. Um, I guess it would be fossils because that's where I've kind of made my name is with fossils and I've discovered a num number of uh, fossil animals that are new to science and and then recently the big cool thing was like hitting the lottery I found a brand new dinosaur had never been found before so for That's me that exciting. was uh, you know the kind of the top of the line so I guess it would be the Missouri dinosaur that's amazing that you can actually say that you've done that yeah okay. so how many different methods are there in collecting artifacts or kind of walk me through the process well, artifacts and relics and fossils are kind of all different things. And uh, ancient artifacts, you know, are, are, would be like Egyptian and Roman and Celtic items. And then relics usually fall into the historical period more with, you know, like fur trade and, and the St. Genevieve time. And then uh, with fossils, that's a really a whole other world from the artifacts and a lot of people get archaeology mixed up with paleontology a lot. Mm -hmm. Usually they'll say guys are archaeologists but it's really it's a totally different field and uh, one deals with prehistoric animals and the other deals with historic, more historic, you know. Okay, so there is a difference there. There's a big difference between paleontology and archaeology. Hey guy, just for our listening public, could you tell them how many paleontologists in their lifetime find a dinosaur that's not known to the people that find dinosaurs uh, are among a very small group and uh, I was I was lucky growing up because I I met a fellow uh, geologist named Bruce Stinchcomb who at a very young age for me showed me that I didn't have to go to Madagascar for instance to make discoveries that they were actually Missouri was full of fossils that no one had found before and uh, um, you have to you have to really be dedicated for instance growing up I never stayed home for Christmas or Thanksgiving or anything like that we were always in the car some other state Canada or somewhere looking for fossils I mean that's how it was for me we, I just did it all the time um, if you have a degree uh, and I have no degree uh, but you're lucky if you can find one or two uh, fossil animals in your lifetime. Maybe they're invertebrates or maybe they're vertebrate animals, but to find a dinosaur was, I was just lucky that this fellow Bruce owned this property and he allowed me years ago to start making a really uh, an effort, a systematic excavation which no one had done before. And we just kept at it and there was enough scraps that, that had been found in the beginning and in 1942 they found the tail section so we knew the stuff was there and really we just kept digging and digging mm -hmm. and even when we found the skeleton there's very few bones showing on the surface of it so you don't know what you have but it was being cleaned in our in our lab lab at the other museum at the Bollinger County Museum and when they finally got it cleaned it ended up there was parts of the skull the neck the shoulder blades the vertebra the ribs and then all of a sudden it stopped and it was a sheer, a perfectly sheared off skeleton where you could tell that the earth moved like this. So we figured the rest of it was there. 
And then now that the people from Chicago, these famous fossil uh, dinosaur uh, hunters, are helping us, uh, we dug down to the area where we thought it would be, and sure enough, we found another block right there full of bones, and we're thinking that that may be the rest of that dinosaur. So, uh, They'll it's, be here next month, right, to continue? Yeah, they'll be, yeah, yeah, in September to come down, dig for a while, and take that back. And the cool thing is, as they say, is whatever information that they have, they'll be able to, I, I think they're talking with a 3D printer, make us a skeleton. So that'll be pretty cool. And the Missouri dinosaur that we always thought it was, it's not that. It's Hypsobema missouriense is our official Missouri State dinosaur. And that's going to all have to change mm -hmm. because this will be a new genus and a new species, not just a new species. Because it's a, and so it looks totally different than the dinosaur that I made for the other museum and the one that we've been touring with. So once we get all that information together, I've got to make a brand new Missouri dinosaur. So, so would it be you. safe to say that the St. Genevieve Museum Learning Center will be the only museum that would have that type of dinosaur on display? It'll for sure have a, uh, uh, yeah, the Missouri dinosaur, model of Missouri dinosaur, yes, yeah. That's incredible. I, I, I've got a question, and I'd like to take you back a step. I'm driving down the interstate, and I get hungry, and I see a blue sign, and the blue sign has three or four restaurant choices at the, at the next pull-off. So I know I can get a burger at one of those three or four. How, <laughs> how do you know that there's no signpost that says dig here? Uh, how do you know where to go? Uh, you, know, you have the what to do part, yeah. but how do you know that that's a place I, there again, I was lucky to meet up with this one fella who really showed me the ropes, Bruce Stinchcomb. And as a young person, he taught me basically to look at a road cut. As I'm going down the highway and I see all these layers of rock, I can look at those layers of rock and I can really kind of see into them. Okay. And it's, since, a little, since a very young age, I would go to a certain formation of rock. And for me, the goal was is to break that rock down and get every little living, or the which used to live, every little creature out of there I could, because I, for one thing, wanted to, wanted to do a book on uh, 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 collecting uh, fossils in Missouri, but I would take each, uh, each formation and go through them really, really carefully, and after you do that, and then you clean them, and you have this collection of all these different layers of Earth's history, you just have a six. I mean, you can be in, a, can be in another state and be going down the highway and I go, oh man, look what we just passed. You know, that, that looks really good. Then other times you can look and go, damn, there ain't nothing in there. And I could be wrong both times. But in most cases, I So there's natural, there's Mother Nature based signposts. And yeah, indicators. And, and it's like the dinosaur site. That was found accidentally in 1942 by a geologist looking for Cretaceous clay in Missouri totally serendipitous. Uh, it, the discovery was made and the paleontologist who, did, who, who wrote that up died and no one ever went back to the Missouri locality in the 70s. This friend of mine, Bruce, bought it. And so I was lucky enough to have this area that we already knew there were dinosaurs. And so it was, we had a good idea if we dug down what we were gonna find. So uh, it's really just one of those, and it, there's areas in Missouri that are just known for fossils, general areas, and uh, the more you get into it, the more you know it's like anything else, you know, mm -hmm. so. Wow, cool. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to be there one time when you found something, uh, the one that we were working those oh, road cuts, right. and he was expanding my mind, showing me how to work a Missouri road cut, and I was maybe two stories up on one, and Guy, you know, less than, it was about four stories up, and I heard him get excited, and when Guy Darrow gets excited, I mean, I mean, I mean there was road cuts, when you look twice at him and see what's in the ground in Missouri, it's just mind-blowing how much life, how extensive the fossil record is here, and he's been working it for his own. So when I heard when he got excited, I had to, I had to get two more stories up to see what he, and got this picture of this, uh, this weird creature's, yeah. you have to take over what it was. Well, but, you got to take the first picture of mm -hmm. it. It's the, uh, one of the, it's a Missouri state fossil is the crinoid. And crinoids are a starfish-like animal that has a stalk. And these little bits of the stalk, they're like little washers, and they're just all over in the rocks of Missouri. 
Well, this one that I had found on a ledge, and it would only took another big rain. It was oh, running. It was just totally washed totally, away. Yeah. I mean, it's sitting there perfectly. And instead of being round columnals that they're called, this stem, this was square, square, like some kind of a uh, mechanical. It's really complex. Heat exchanger or something. Yeah, but then it, it actually went down to a round stem, and then the head was on there actually, which we didn't really know that day until it got cleaned. <laughs> but. Uh, that was a brand new, that'll be a brand new species that I get the name. The first human to see it. I yeah. Be the second. You use the second, you took the <laughs> picture that's of the it. Kind yeah. of amazing and, thing. And that's it? just the way it is. The more you look, you, it, if you wanted to find a new beetle or a new insect in Missouri, and you had a whole bunch of kids make that their project, somebody's going to turn over a log and they're going to go, holy smoke, no one's ever seen that before. No one's ever paid attention to it. There's a lot of stuff. Or, it, or it, people that's new to science, you know, it's just like in the rivers, you know, the more they work with rivers, the more things that they find. And, and one of the things we were thinking is, wouldn't it be cool to put some one of these little cameras down in some of these salt springs or sulfur springs in Missouri? What animals are alive down there doing, going about their normal business that no one has ever seen before? You know, and the, and the equipment is available now to, to purchase grease will be cheap and monitor what's going on in a sulfur spring or a, a salt spring. Them animals are totally different. So no. what it is is I'm just hoping we process enough little brains, kids' brains, uh, to take up the vacuum of all of us guys that have been doing this stuff. And when we go, I'm not seeing a lot of what to fill that vacuum. I'm not seeing it. So that's why I'm hoping that Learning Center part of our museum name we're going to actually, you know, be processing some, come up with the next paleontologist or biologist or ichthyologist or whatever, you know. So, Kendall, uh, as art director, what's going to be your primary responsibilities? Uh, I, I thought of that answer, and it's if you can look at it, it's my realm. Every everything in print, paint, uh, even preparing the exhibits. Uh, my studio currently does life-size creatures such as this fellow here, and meeting Guy through our studios, both through Life Size. I'm also someone that would repair things should anyone get too adventurous with an exhibit, but I'll also be responsible for all the marketing collateral. Um, throughout my career, I've done billboards, truck wraps, business cards, I'll manage and maintain the website as I still do, and so if you can see it or read it, I'll be responsible for making it legible and color corrected. <laughs> do you have a preference in assignments or something that you enjoy doing more so than the other. Mm. Oh, wow. Diorama. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty amazing there. Um, I really, if, if the answer is kind of the opposite of what I'm expecting. It's really the variety of what I get to do. The fact mm -hmm. that I may one day go put a dinosaur toenail back on and then the next day update the website. I mean, I just love the variety in doing something that's creative. So, mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't, but I, I love every bit of it. And, I, and the graphics, too. Oh. I mean, without. Mm -hmm. The graphics in the museum that's what makes everything pop every bit of and science, Kendall's yeah. burdened with that for sure but that's been my career for 20 years that and sculpting so I'm looking really really looking forward to it. I think this position just fulfills everything I want to do with my career and my life well we're glad to have you Thank definitely you. and this creature does have a name I take it oh this is a, uh, a, a rendition of a uh, kobold which is the German word for uh, goblin and also where we get our word for cobalt, because the myths behind this, they populated and uh, terrorized the uh, cobalt miners. And so that word has come down to us, to, from cobalt to cobalt. And uh, this guy is uh, a life-size representation of uh, that creature. That's part of my, been my day job for about a year and a half now, is uh, creating life-size creatures and touring. Uh, there was another thing guys taught me, is <laughs> to create uh, life-size touring exhibits. So. How do you start whenever you create something like that? What first idea that comes to mind? Um, first thing that is, really comes is character. It's, it's the kind of intangible qualities before it becomes engineering. It's what I want to build, what, how I want it posed, and what I want it wearing. All these things that you know, get excited about the idea and then temper it against the anvil of engineering and what's possible. If it's going to be just a guy this tall, I can just use steel wire and get this shape and these uh, epoxy clay. But when I start building my 35-foot dragon, things change. But it goes from mm -hmm. uh, inspiration to construction. And That's great. And you're going to apply everything that you know into building the dinosaurs as well and mm -hmm. helping Guy with that? 
Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's got uh, Shane Folks would be another person that would be so integral to that, his paint job on these mm -hmm. things. But uh, when they're not around, and like I say, usually a toenail is going to get broke off by some, <laughs> someone's going to reach something, and that's what's been my job on his, on his touring show as well, is put small body parts back onto dinosaurs. So <laughs> I know his models, I know how to fix them, <laughs> I, I know. There you go. So, Joanna, you have the job of marketing right. as our learning center grows. Can you share some of your strategies as we move forward with it? I think the biggest strategy is just involvement. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can get as many people involved um, locally, um, the more that we can get the word out. And I think also that we need to, um, you know, do traditional marketing and pair it with more modern marketing for millennials and uh, younger generations. Mm -hmm. So um, um, Bob was mentioning the QR codes um, mm -hmm. and exhibits and, um, you know, um, just getting uh, having a nice digital footprint um, on the web on up through our website through blogs um, tag boards I, I think all of that is is essential to marketing for the museum. I like how you want to do the traditional and the somewhat new age because it seems like a lot of museums are just trying to focus on the new age and we kind of forget about getting back to our roots well just uh, the small amount of time that I've spent in the um, museum, the the old museum, the current yeah. museum, mm -hmm. um, people here are absolutely attached to their historical roots, and um, they're it, it's it's charming and it's at the same time, you know, and we there's no reason to let go of that. There's mm -hmm. no reason to to completely um, put that aside because that is still very useful. I mean, radio, billboards, newspaper community involvement, you can't replace that with QR codes. Yeah, exactly. That's perfect. Uh, so you've been recently working at the museum mm -hmm. yeah. and in extension with our town's historian, Bob Mueller. Right. Can you share some of the information you've been able to glean from him or what's your favorite part about working at the museum now? Well, Bob and I have made a deal <laughs> and he agreed to show me around town, fill me in on um, a lot of the history, uh, if I could do some um, French translations for him. <laughs> the documents that he gave me for translation are, are really interesting. They're land deeds from um, 1804 and uh, a letter from a friend in Philadelphia in the early in 1804 or 1807 as well. So translating them is not hard, it's deciphering the, the actual written language. Um, but what I've really enjoyed is um, is the French heritage. About, um, having lived in France myself, I, mm -hmm. I, I uh, have an affinity for that, so I really enjoy that. And um, But mostly the people coming in the museum, they're excited. There was one time a, a six-year-old boy who came in the museum. It was his first time in any museum. So, I mean, everything was new, the old stuff was new to him and that that's really exciting that's awesome yeah. yeah and even though we're going to be moving over to a larger facility we're still trying to expand what we do with the community as well absolutely so um well i mean working um rich um had an idea we were talking about working with uh, local artists and artisans mm -hmm. um as well as local businesses i mean you can't be alone in a community you have to to get everyone involved and um, showcasing them and um, exchanging um, ideas and exchanging um, um, you know um, talents I think is a necessity for um, to, to stay involved to stay important in the community so well I'm glad we found you guys <laughs> definitely an asset to our project step as a follow-up to that yeah tell us what your favorite part of that museum is oh my goodness uh, the fact that it continually surprises me whenever we go in there we're always finding a new hiding spot for artifacts because i know in a previous spotlight show we have uh, discussed the whole finding of artifacts on top of the current displays and just we were moving around the uh, arrowheads the other day and the intern susie and i she picked up a little box and we found more arrowheads underneath the box so it's it's never ending there's always something and it's just neat and it's given me a deeper appreciation for history as well and especially looking into my german heritage that's been really neat and the museum is just i don't know it's kind of like kismet 
<laughs> you know, this is a bit of a switch. The guests are asking the <laughs> questions. So while you've got set a stage, why don't you share with everybody what we did last Thursday, two Thursday nights ago okay. at 10.30 in the evening and My go goodness. back to the very beginning and lay it all out. All and right. Then, then we'll get into the items that are on the table here. Do you want to switch me spots No, here? no, no. <laughs> You're on the hot seat now. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Well, uh, I guess Bob was here whenever, was with me whenever the idea originated. Rhett Oldham, a history teacher over at St. Jen, he mentioned the idea of doing a virtual Skype lesson slash tour of the museum to educators across the world. Not even country, just the world. And we kind of, it kind of got the wheels turning like, okay, this is something we can do. We have a laptop with a webcam. I mean, I'm sure we can put something together. So but the intern and I, Susie, we looked into it and we came, we developed lesson plans and different aspects of teaching involved with the museum that we could kind of project and we put it into age groups too. One of them was singing with the Lagioni and we made that ages like eight to 12 and then we went into Catholicism and its traditions and then we went into Native American slash French settlers and then we just bumped up the age group with each but made it easy for all ages to uh, have the option to watch it as well. I mean, so it kind of all ties in together. But yeah, so we became a certified educator on the Microsoft Education Platform and got brought in the webcam and we had uh, requests right away. The, ha the way they have it set up is a educator or a teacher with a classroom full of students interested in the tour, they message us, say, hey, we're interested. This is the day, this is the time. And I figured out it got a little tricky whenever we were messing with time zones because there's, <laughs> it's worldwide, so India, Brazil, I mean, you name it, Indonesia. So we've had at least nine pending requests. Yeah, at the moment. So, and then two weeks ago, we did our first Skype over to a classroom in India. So that was kind of neat. We went from a museum who did not have a working computer to broadcasting <laughs> across the ocean. So that was kind of neat. And I was really glad to be a part of that. We had to come in at 1030 at night. To, on a Thursday evening to broadcast to them at 9 a.m. on Friday. So, yeah, it was interesting. And um, it's also, I mean, it's been all amazing. So, thank you for that question. Thank you for that question as well. Back on task. <laughs> yes. So, Guy, in some circles, you're referred to as the dinosaur man. Um, so, your involvement with these creatures in the past is pretty obvious. You go out, you search for the fossils, and then you build, basically reconstruct them from scratch. Uh, what did you bring with us today? Uh, Fossil-wise, I've got an egg from a dinosaur uh, called Hepsilosaurus. It, they found this, the first, first one of these were found was at like in 1940, I mean 1843. And to this very day, uh, they call it, uh, they named it Hypsilosaurus priscus, uh, but uh, it's, which is a sauropod. That's one of the big long neck, long tail guys. And they say this one's about 45 feet long, weighed, weighed 10 tons, the, the uh, full size. The thing that makes this kind of mysterious still, even though this is the, probably the first dinosaur eggs that were ever found were these from France, is it Provence, am I saying uh -huh. that right? Uh -huh. And that's where this was found, uh, uh, found in that area. And what makes this unusual is the shell on this is very thin. It's like like the thickness of heavy uh, uh, cardboard. And I don't mean corrugated, I mean just cardboard. And most of these dinosaurs, when you find those eggs, the shells are about this thick. And the reason being is they don't squat down too much when they lay these. They make a nest with their feet, which is irregular. And then from a great distance, these things are dropping into the nest and they're just bouncing and banging around just like turtles do on a, you know, on a very large scale. This is very, very thin eggshell, uh, so they're really mystified. So what it leads me to believe is 
and everything is changing in the fossil world. They could find out that this is not a Hypsilosaurus egg. I mean, they're finding out that Tyrannosaurus were feathered and all kinds of other things. Uh, so everything is changing. So they're calling it Hypsilosaurus. Uh, it could end up being a different, a, a different egg because that's a pretty thin egg to be dropping 10 or 15 feet into a nest, you know. So mm -hmm. that that's what this guy's all about. And also, most of the dinosaur eggs in this country are semi-off limits uh, because a lot of them are from France and Argentina, and these are countries that really don't want those things leaving. The French, however, and I got this back when I was about 18 years old. And they're, you can't get them now. Uh, but the French are not after them. They're all very, you know, so this is one that, that we can uh, display without ever having any problems because, you know, it's kind of nice to have a dinosaur egg with your dinosaur exhibits, you yeah. know, so. Do you think the children will be able to touch that? We have so many touchables that they won't be able, and I really wouldn't want them to touch this, but I have an exact duplicate of it as mm -hmm. a replica, which, which could be handled and touched. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a little too delicate. I mean, people could touch it like this all day long, but chances are eventually someone will pick something off of it. Yeah. So we'll put that one behind glass. Okay. These I can't fix. <laughs> yeah, those are real hard, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Now, is there, is there something still inside Possibly of it? an embryo. I think I had this one scanned many years ago when I worked with the Science Center, and I believe it's empty. Um, this area right here, you, there's not much eggshell on there, and I got to figure. Uh, I'm figuring that's probably where it came out. Okay. Is this area right here? Mm -hmm. And uh, it used to be back when I was a kid, you could get those eggs, gorgeous ones, for three or four thousand dollars, and now you just can't get them. And I'm very glad I grabbed that one when I had a chance because it's it's just illegal. You know, you can't, uh, some of the people that have had uh, Chinese dinosaur eggs in exhibits have had problems in the past, so we don't want any problems. Right. You know, no, so we don't. At least I got one that I can, a what big one that I can What would have preserved that? What caused that one to be preserved? What most, would be one of the things that happened there? Most times these are nesting sites where they've done it every year. Uh, you can go back and look at the rock and every, you know, every two or three inches there's layers of eggshell where they've been coming back year after year. Usually they're on floodplains. For whatever reason, dinosaurs like that, huh. uh, and so chances are the water came up, smothered all these little guys. That's what happens to the Chinese ones, and, and a lot of them. You know, it's they just are lucky enough to be covered quickly, and then that preserves them usually. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of Chinese artifacts, what's that right next to the egg? This right here. Yes. These are. I got a whole bunch of these, and I wasn't sure what exactly. Uh, they were used for, but I've narrowed it down that these are probably from the Boxer Rebellion, which was a time in China right around the turn of the century when the Chinese decided there were too many foreigners in their country and they wanted to get them out. And um, so there was a whole lot of conflict and, and a lot of Chinese came up with these secret societies and you know when you see these uh, Kung Fu type guys with all these different weird weapons, I used to think that was all a bunch of baloney. But then a friend of mine, Shang, in China, uh, started started uh, dealing with him and getting. And there's all a lot of these weird weapons were around for a reason. They they called it's the Boxer Rebellion is what it was called, and they called them boxers because the people that didn't know much about these guys, they were doing all these martial arts. A lot of it looked like boxing, so that just stuck. The Boxer Rebellion. And a lot of it was peasants. They had no money, so they're not really going to be able to have cartridge guns and cartridge weapons. So they started lots of pole arms, lots of spears and things, lots of pole arms with tridents on the end and all kinds of fancy stuff. Uh, one thing we did find out is uh, this little motif here, this little design uh, is on a lot of the Boxer Rebellion weapons. I can't find hardly anything to do with it. Um, it looks like a non-traditional butterfly sword. Yeah, it's... The, the portions are different, but the shapes... For the Boxer Rebellion, this is like their classical thing, you know, that, yeah. that they would use. These, since they didn't have the uh, cartridge weapons, these are uh, different types of pole cannons, they're called. There'd be a pole in here, one guy would hold it, he would revolve it, the other guy would touch took two men to operate these, the other guy would put a, uh, a flame to this or a fuse and they were uh, mostly, you'd have, have like, a, if you can imagine a huge wall, 
you got a couple hundred guys behind the wall hidden. They've got so I've got some of these that are like 15 or 20 barrels. It's really insane. And 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 you've got a whole army coming at you, and then all of a sudden you've got like hundreds of barrels. They said a lot of times they would fill these with sand just to blind the horses so that everything started. I mean, it was a mess. Chaos. It was chaos. Uh, that's one of the types there. Then there's this other, which is really a wild looking thing. This would have had a pole and another guy would have been touching these off. And you can just look and tell a different culture devised these because this looks like nothing that we would do in this country here. This is a little one barrel job and this one really looks very old. Some of these three barrel ones go back to the 1700s. These do not. When I originally got them I thought wow these things are old and then I got looking at them and I mean they're old but you can see that there's like welds on them and they're not the kind of weld uh, right before the turn of the century I think the Russians developed arc welding and of course lathes and things like that have been around for a couple hundred years before that so with that primitive technology they managed to come up with some weapons to fight with uh, to try to drive the uh, you know foreigners out of out of uh, China I've got a whole bunch of weird weapons and I wouldn't have gave anything like this a second thought before I got into it and found out this stuff is all real mm -hmm. but this is a, this is a whip but but this thing right here was used in, in, and they could plant this in you. And there's, uh, I seen on YouTube the other day, a bunch of older Chinese men with these uh, tops, wooden tops with string. They were flipping these things about 20 feet and making that top land on a little tiny pedestal and spin. And they were all doing it over and over. So you can easily imagine you know, these martial arts guys learning how to take this and plant this in your head or something, pretty horrible. But there's a whole bunch of strange weapons like this. And uh, I just thought it would be kind of a cool thing. You never hear about the Rock Fox Rebellion very much at all. And I think there's not a lot of information out there because I just don't think China is disseminated. And, and if I knew Chinese, maybe I would have access more to that information. Mm -hmm. So I'm still not really sure about some of this stuff other than whenever you see pictures of the Boxer Rebellion, they have similar, and, and, and the technology shows that it's right around the turn of the century. And these were probably filled with their magic black powder? Yeah, 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 yeah they had in, in probably balls mm -hmm. or whatever, hot sand, little rocks or whatever, when things got down to the nitty gritty, you could shoot, you could shoot a stick out of there, a pointed stick if you had to. Mm -hmm. So. Things were, you know, the British and everybody had, uh, uh, everybody had uh, rifles with cartridges, and, and these guys had to do with. And whenever you look this stuff up on the internet, it has a lot to do with people's heads getting cut off. Some very bad pictures, lots of very bad pictures. If you look up the Boxer Rebellion, it can get a little depressing. But they're so weird and they're so cool that I thought it would be something nice to have in the museum because we want to show a lot of cool things, keep your brain moving. Mm -hmm. and, and the way this would rotate, we're looking at a first generation Gatling gun. Oh, if yeah. you have 200 plus people on a, you yeah. know, manning a wall. Yeah. And that this All of a sudden, fun. yeah. 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 No, this is the, in some of the really old ones that positively are from the 1700s are made just like this. It's just that they're more wrought, They're more hand wrought, and this one's got a little bit of machining. These little welds here very possibly could be done by a blacksmith, but some of it just looks like a little bit of arc welding uh, possibly, but, but like I say, I think arc welding was uh, invented right before the turn of the century, so it really makes sense. Yeah, that collar is rolled steel, and then they've sutured up one side of it, haven't they? Right here? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is this is more common blacksmithing, but uh, and maybe I'm wrong. This might have been totally done on a forge. That's what I'd be hoping. I don't like I you know I prefer that, but uh, mm -hmm. you know that's. So Joanna, when you learn to talk Chinese, <laughs> Chinese. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's start, a project. Yeah, that's, that's we're, start we're, working on that. Yeah. We're impressed that you can speak French. We'll be more impressed when you and when just, you communicate in Chinese. <laughs> that's a serious thing. It would be cool to have somebody try to research yeah. that a little. The Boxer Rebellion weapons, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you looked that up, you're just not going to get much on Google. You really, right. I mean, but 
somebody might do a better job than I have. Tried to find an expert or something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What else did you bring with you, Guy? This thing here is a is a scrub brush, and you look at that, you go, well, "What the deal is with this?" This was found on the banks of the Mississippi River after it was very, very uh, the river was low, and the only reason it was preserved is because river mud preserves it. And the cool thing about this to me, and I, I got it only because it was a colonial artifact from a, this friend of mine that found it. But I didn't know until I washed it off, but these, these little areas here, these little bristles, each one of those is a scouring rush, which is called equisetum. It's a uh, horsetail rush. Okay. And a lot of cultures use that for scrubbing. You put a bundle of them together and wrap them together and you could scrub, for instance, if you were an Indian, you could maybe use that for on your teeth or for scrubbing something, or if you're a pie or an early, uh, early French person, you might use that to clean up the bottom of a pot or something, a handful of those. Uh, the reason it, it works good is because horsetail rushes get silica out of the ground, and so when you rub one of those horsetail rushes, it feels gritty. That's because it's little bits of silica all over it, and that's why it's a good scrubbing. Mm -hmm. But when I seen those, so in other words, it took the the scrubbing, the scrubbing uh, horsetail reeds to another level. So, so in other words, I, I just got a feeling that probably a French person or someone. Uh, took this Indian idea to the next level and they put the little horse tails in there and of course they would have extended out and then they locked them in with a little bit of uh, uh, brass wire but this was at a time when you needed a scrub brush you didn't go to Walmart mm -hmm. it was up to you to make your scrub brush so to me uh, I, to me it's more important than a lot of this stuff because this really goes back and if, if you're if you understand what horsetail rushes I mean this is really a cool cool artifact and something that I'd like to put in the museum so mm -hmm. so they may have used that to the nth degree they didn't throw it away mm -hmm. as it wore down <laughs> they, they, right yeah, down. Wore the, and chances are they would replace those horsetail rushes sure. after those went down you made your handle you know why make another handle why not just place uh, the scouring rushes it's interesting how much they used horsetail for because the violin at the museum I think you pointed it out whenever you were there the other day uh, the strings on the bow are horsetail oh God. yeah oh. it's kind of it's kind of interesting yes yeah, so to me that was a, yeah. Yeah. At the Guioni display it was a cool artifact yeah and the trade beads yeah Is that what those uh, if you are? were a, uh, a Native American and you, uh, if you were a Native American uh, your adornments were made out of shells which would have been brought up from the Gulf traded mm -hmm. and uh, that's what you would have been used to and then you would have had like larger shell portions things of this nature like like this this is what you would have had if you were a Native American uh, not necessarily a female um, and then we have uh, here's another variety here and so if that's all you had and then all of a sudden a fur trapper pulled this out and wanted to do some trading and held that up to the sun, mm -hmm. um, your Indian wife would really be on you <laughs> to make this happen for her. So the trading was, was, it really worked out good because this was like magic. You'd hold that up to the sun and these Indian women, would, or and even the men, they'd go, holy moly, what is that? They'd never seen glass before. This is what they had right here. So really, it's, it's quite a difference, especially when you throw the sun into the mix. Mm -hmm. And I brought a whole variety. These, these right here are called pressed facets. You would take a little glob of glass, you would stick a little metal, uh, like a, a, a awl or a needle through it, and then while it was still uh, liquid, you'd take a little paddle and you'd press the facets on it. That's why they're called pressed facets. That's why it gives them these prismatic, these uh, faceted uh, uh, look. A lot of these were made in Venice. There was a lot of glass going on over there at that time. Here's more varieties. These, by the way, uh, none of these are African trade beads. That's a whole other subject. They're a lot more common. These are all picked off of Indian sites from the, like the 1850s and 30s and 20s. You'd be you know, tilling your field, and one of these would pop up. 
you grab that up and after a while you've got a cigar box full of them and then they eventually sift it into the hands of collectors. But a strand like this would be like, you know, 1500 bucks. These are not, these are like the, the these are really the fur trade really from this country, known sites, but mostly down south. And I really uh, took a liking to yeah. trade beads. So this represents a whole lot of money uh, as far as that goes. But I wanted to, it, uh, it's, it's perfect for St. Genevieve because of the fur trade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that, you know, if you're a fur trapper and you start to deal and you start pulling these out, and setting them down, you know, people are going to start paying attention and they'll start giving you more pelts or whatever you're after, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was something, it's like these right here. That probably right there is, you know, being monetary, but that's another like 1500 or a, a thousand, a couple thousand dollars. These are what they call mandrel wound beads. While it was, what they would do while it was liquid is they grab a blob onto a little all or a mandrel and they get a little strand of the glass liquid coming off and then they would wind that and it winds that strand of glass over it takes a while to do that to get that beautiful opalescent uh, little bead is all wound strands so they're called mandrel wounds and then uh, there's a lot of names for like for instance this guy here some of these little ones here, they call them gooseberries or onions. You see, they look like gooseberries and onions. And some of them, uh, like this one right here, they call those uh, raspberries and uh, lots of different. Uh, there's really not a lot out there about trade beads. There's just very little uh, books on the trade beads and the names for these things. And uh, it's, uh, I've got quite a collection of those. Yeah, those are called, uh, uh, I think they're called snake beads. We call them caterpillars around here. It looks like a, <laughs> it looks like a caterpillar biting its head, yeah. You know, and here's uh, some very large, larger Native American. And, and there again, that's a perfect example here. You know, which would you rather have if you had your choice? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why glass really, uh, really took over. Here's some tiny little little gastropods, little snails called marginella shell, shells, and each one has been ground down the front and the back so you can slip a string okay. through it. When they find these, they'll find it by the thousands. So they were used like this, but, but I got a feeling, and, and not just me, a lot of people, that they were sewn on clothing for decorations because when they find them, they'll find a whole mass of them like a garment had disintegrated. And uh, you want me to go into these Viking ones? Yeah. I really have a thing for Viking stuff, and there's so many things coming out of the Ukraine right now that are very uh, poor areas, and there's a lot of conflict and stuff, so everybody has a metal detector, and the ground over there is full of every culture there is. It's just stacked one on the other, but this is a Viking uh, brooch, and uh, it's got these cool little duck feet, and a lot of the Viking jewelry that we've got had these duck feet and we had no idea I was trying to look it up what the deal is and uh, we found out that they're well they're from an area called Lake Ladoga which is one of the biggest lakes in the world and but we found out that it's the crossroads for more waterfowl than almost anywhere so all the Viking settlements would have had ducks hanging everywhere and apparently that duck foot motif um, it's one of the prime, uh, it's on a lot of the Viking uh, uh, jewelry. This is a very cool little thing. Very strange, you can tell it, it took a whole different uh, culture, a whole different brain to come up with that design. And then, uh, What's the value of something like this? That, I, that one I paid $200 for. Um, here's the thing with ancient artifacts going back hundreds of years with collectors collecting them. All these things belong to somebody. And they were all lost or buried. Mm -hmm. And you don't, when you're metal detecting a lot of times, you don't know if, until you get into it, maybe you're on a, a, in a burial or something you don't know. But a lot of times these things are just lost. They're just out in the dirt. And uh, here's a little guy that's in a couple pieces that I gotta, that I gotta put back together. But it's kind of another cool, it's got little bells 
which have little mouse like little dragons, which is a cool little cool little artifact. So would they pin most of these on their armor or this clothing? is mostly women's jewelry. Oh. Yeah, at that time a Viking woman was just really loaded with with all kinds of bronze. Uh, everything is bronze over there. They have no brass, of course. It's a bronze. And uh, a lot of these were women's jewelry. And then I brought some Viking beads, which are, have similarities to some of these beads from this country. But uh, although these, uh, but that's, those, that's what a, a Viking woman would have wore, is those kind of beads, which are, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, we ours is color, our beads from the early 18th or 1700s is colorful. This is 900 years old. And you know, the, the uh -huh. colors are actually almost better, you know, yeah. as far as color goes. So uh, beads, beads, have, beads have always been money, always, and they're money today. I mean, here this is 900 years old or 1,000, and I think I paid 250 bucks for it. it so today, each, each what was money back then is still money still today, money. And, and it'll continue to be that way for. Now, what are those beads made out yeah, of? Are they uh, glass. glass? Are they glass? Glass, yeah. So the blue ones are probably, uh, excuse me, cobalt, I would guess. Yeah, and some of those, if you see a little gold on the inside of some of them, they put a gold foil inside and they mm -hmm. built up glass around them. Mm -hmm. Wow. It is incredible if you go back and try to put yourself in the person who wore those mm -hmm. shoes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there was a real person that yeah, and, those And ones. there again, that, that's a, a, a selection of beads. But in reality, I'm, I just know that none of those beads or a handful of maybe were found together, but they were oh, collected right. over long. So each one of those beads probably has its own story, its own whole history. Wow. Who knows what... Uh, the same way with all this material here, who knows what history and, and, and what happened with, with all, these, all these beads here and all the people that owned them. This is an interesting piece. Yeah, those are called Russian blues, but they have very little to do with Russia. Uh, it was just a slang that was given to them, but they're usually not, uh, not a translucent bead at all. And uh, those actually were found in California, and they're like... 1750 on till into the 1800s. You can see each one of them has a patina on it that showed that it was in the ground. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the same way with all these. The reason that these all are slightly frosted is they all they've all come out of the ground. Wow. These have the same type of facade. They look like they've been flattened on several sides. Those are actually ground on a uh, a big grindstone. Okay. Yeah, those are actually on an ancient grindstone, uh, one that's revolving. Okay. okay. They would put those facets on. Mm -hmm. They would make long glass rods, and then they would break them into little pieces. Uh -huh. Then they would put them in primitive tumblers, and that tumbled the broken areas a lot of times, smooths them right. down. Yeah. And then they would they would put them on a uh, on a wheel. What 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 do they struggle with? Is it um, a, a twine? A yeah, string, just a, a twine, wire? yeah. Uh, some of them I've got like fishing thread through them, you know. Uh -huh. uh, these show a lot of age. You know, all that brown on there is a lot of age on those. Well, would they have been strung with like sinew? Or? It would have been, for me, I mean, since I got horses and I was stringing some, I was using Horse. tail. Oh, you okay. know, I mean, you get a few of those and kind of weave them together, you got something that's pretty solid. So you could have. But there's a lot of, uh, yeah, feel that. I had some Viking okay. beads recently and I was washing them up carefully and all of a sudden little things started going down the sink. Down and I was what the heck is this? And sure enough, each one of the beads had a Viking twine that had been oh. handmade that were on each one. So I carefully pulled them out <laughs> and put them up. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of, they were very good at making you know, cordage at that time because mm -hmm. that was a major part of their life. And, uh, these are pretty, these are mandrel wound, opaline colored, pretty beads. And those would have been more translucent. That has a lot of ground patina on them that's etched to glass. Mm -hmm. Now, in a, in a museum setting, how is the, uh, the similar ones 
um, laid out together or these could be put in in, in the periods that they were used, used or they could be a display of trade goods um, there's all, all different ways they kind of blend into a number of different <laughs> subjects you know so while I have you guy and Kendall here I know we are going over the blueprints and trying to figure out what we're going to have where and everything. Can you give us a general overview of what we're going to focus on in the first exhibits? Well, let me jump back just a hair. We were thinking on the way over here. What is the part of the building that the most of us together can work on to create with other ideas without getting into artifacts or relics or, or Graphics, are, and we were thinking the upstairs is a room that we all hit, could have input on. And it's a room I think that we could get get the plan done quicker than the display area because me and Kendall's got a lot of work to do down there. But so we thought we maybe would uh, could zero in on the upstairs. That's something that we could get done that needs to be done. And we need our offices upstairs, for instance. My friend Danny, that's going to give us this collection that's worth uh, uh, half a million dollars or whatever. We need a place to put that where I was hoping, Stephanie, you could help mm -hmm. go over and curate all this. I mean, it's thousands of items from all over the world. And uh, so we need a place to do that. And if the upstairs was lined out to where we could start storing some valuables up there. We really need a room to, to go through all that stuff and organize it. Uh, it has to be appraised before he can give it to us, so that the so he can get his benefit from giving up, giving it to us. You know, so that's one reason that the upstairs would be nice to have some working areas quicker than downstairs. Perfect use of the lab space we've talked about. Yes. I mean, the perfect use of it. Yeah, that's what it, that's what we went that far. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so there'll be temporary and permanent exhibits. In the upstairs. Museum. Well, just anywhere in the museum. Yeah. To to me, the rooms upstairs that are big and open, that are multiple uh, rooms. You may have set up all chairs in there one day for a talk or a, a film. Next day they're gone, and, and I was thinking the conservation department might give us a temporary exhibit for a month. All of a sudden it's in there, and then it disappears, and then we have... Also, there's a lot of clubs that want a place to come to have their fossil exhibits or their rock exhibits or their artifacts or something, and if we could provide the space to do that, they pay to do that, and also then that's going to bring a lot of people mm -hmm. just to see what they got going there. So. You know, one of the rooms, you know, should be a multi-purpose, and that's what we were thinking. Yeah. That and uh, so, that to me, special. it seems like that's something that all of us together could brainstorm upstairs reasonably soon, whereas we've got to figure out where each display case goes, and, and, and it's going to be a lot slower than the upstairs. But we need the upstairs now, mm -hmm. so I think that's... Uh, we haven't mentioned this calling card that's laid oh, yeah. in front of Kendall. This is a Viking battle axe, and I collect Viking battle axes, and this is Kendall's. Uh, he got it from a, a fellow from the Ukraine that, that uh, metal detects for these things, but it just shows you what a Viking battle axe, one of the styles, and of course this was something that if your opponent had a, a shield, you know, you could really be doing some whacking with this and, and probably get through that shield. And uh, and uh, this is, uh, was this, this handle was carved by one of those guys over there that, that collects that stuff. It's pretty good. It's a Celtic Viking design on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just gives you an idea, you know. Yeah. And I know a lot of the things that I've collected over the years are weapons. And uh, it's a sad thing that that's what they're used for. <laughs> But they're still very interesting, all the same, and, and we've uh, we've got a lot of uh, varieties of those exhibit from different cultures. But that design carried over into the Americas. Why well, I see holes the bearded that are made. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with this mm -hmm. mounting yeah. on the uh, shaft there. The way that the shape way is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you think about it, everybody, all the everybody that came from Europe that came over here brought all their old technology with them, and you can see that. For instance, there are Viking heart-shaped brooches that are identical to the fur trade silver brooches that were traded all the time. And you can see that 
that technology, that thought, that uh, motif and style came right from Europe, right over here. Same way with all the fire strikers and all that. Everything looks European uh, because basically it was European designs and thoughts that, that uh, brought them over and taught that to the, to the craftsmen here. So uh, almost everything that was old, everything we have now somehow came from what was old. You know, you can see that uh, flavor in it. So, mm -hmm. do we have an idea of when we want to be open? <laughs> yeah. Keith Kendall has Kendall right. mentioned a date today, which you know, I know I there's a lot of people that date, have been asking. Well, if we don't have I mean, a target date. At some tentative. point, we got to buckle up. I and believe say, deadlines. Pressure creates diamonds. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. It, 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 it makes <laughs> short it. answers. Yeah. yeah. That's true. So, so what was that? June. June first. Oh boy. All right. Yeah. June first of 2018. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let's. We need to get our running shoes on. Let's let's <laughs> mark the calendar, yeah, and then exactly. that's our that's our. Uh, it's good motivation. We've got it all is. the things. We've got all the people. Mm -hmm. Did you hear me swallow your heart? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we got to have a deadline. We got to have something to work towards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you give yeah. us two more years, we'll take two more years. Yeah. Give us. Yeah. You know, ten more months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the sooner it's going, the better. You know, the sooner it's up and running, the better. Yeah. So, okay. how did you two meet? I never asked this. Oh, I moved to Missouri uh, maybe five, six years ago, and I lived out in outside of Ebo, Missouri. And if people in this town even know where that is, <laughs> outside of Ebo, Missouri, on 150 cool. acres. So I mean, you're talking nowhere. And I knew no one in the area. I'm like, well, I need to start meeting people and make friends. I'm a life size sculptor. I just typed in life size sculptor to St. Louis, Missouri. I think into like Google or something. I'm like, well, I'm just gonna find an artist. Somewhere, I mean, certainly the you know, life, life size sculpture is most likely in St. Louis. So I typed that in, and it came up with Guy Darrow, Lost World Studios. And I'm like, oh, okay, so let's see what this guy does. And he does uh, life size dinosaurs. Why do you life size monsters? This is so cool. Let's just, I, mean, I think I emailed you, and I, let's, let's just, and I said, let's just talk about art, you know? Yeah. And you thought I was looking for a job or work or something. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, showed yeah, up with yeah, a dinosaur, yeah. like, could you paint this? <laughs> dinosaur artists, I've been through all of them, and I, it's one of those things that I'd almost rather do it myself because all of us artists got problems. And I know normally, and Doris was saying, I don't know if you should get back with that guy. It could be another problem. <laughs> and uh, I said the same that was thing. Last I, week. I, really don't, <laughs> I don't want to know too many more people down here. I mean, but I uh, gave him a call, and then. You uh, just happened to be 20 minutes from my house. I yeah. thought you were in, well, you had a house in Arnold, so I thought you were in yeah. St. Louis. And, but you just happened to be uh, outside just Cadet. Right I was outside the, Potosi. I mean, it was. It was a perfect deal, and then I, I could see Kendall actually could pull off the things that he, he said he could do. And uh, he does, and the graphics, he did a lot of graphics for me at the uh, Bollinger County Museum, and then from that I could tell that, that he was good. And then not long ago, I mentioned to one of the directors of one of the gardens that I've done a number of shows for that a friend of mine could pull off this big show. And I thought, oh boy, should I, <laughs> is he really gonna be able to do it? But after all kinds of insanity, he put his show together, pretty big effort. It's on display right now in Kansas mm -hmm. City. He does what he said he's going to do, and very few people do There's that. The there it is. Yeah, <laughs> very few people can pull off what he pulled off. So he's good for he's good for the museum here. It's going to work out. So it's really impressive because you're pulling off a show of this magnitude, and you're also helping us with the museum, keeping up to date and on the website and just social media and everything. It's it's amazing. I believe in pushing yourself, not facing yourself, and, and just keep yourself at the edge and see what, see what you can get, see what you can do. And, yeah, you, know. you don't have a little pressure, and you really don't push yourself. Not, and the yeah. reason no one's making money with his show is because no one's, after all these years, no one's been able to pull it off. No one had, I should say, no one had the oomph yeah. to make it happen. So you just got to force yourself to do these things. You know? I've never heard of it before. Uh, it's. Life. Intense awesome. to build it. We, we built it in six months. Six uh, months. Oh my gosh. Seven days a week. Rich. 90 yes. hours a week. <laughs> yeah, and on the way over here, team. I was saying, Kendall and Joanna, I know you guys got along really good through that period and everything was smooth. <laughs> you know, watching everything guys. Was great. <laughs> watching guys' insanity and. and, and uh, it prepared <laughs> me as best as we could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So he's got his show still going and doing museums, so, you know. That's awesome. So, so awesome. Awesome.
Well, we're just about out of time. It looks like we have one more minute left. Thank you guys for joining us this evening. It's been great. And I hope to see you next month. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks.